Welcome, everyone. My name is Robin Lloyd, and this is a session of the Burlington, Vermont Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, our monthly meeting. And we are very honored today to have two women who have recently returned from Nicaragua who will speak to us. And uh, But before that, I want to let them know and bring them up to date a little bit on our Burlington um, uh, connection with Nicaragua. You can see the poster behind me, Puerto Cabezas, Nicaragua. Well, uh, our Senator, who whose name is Bernie Sanderista, went to Nicaragua <laughs> and um, the um, Sandinistas then said, yes, you must have a sister city. And he uh, assigned us to Puerto Cabezas and we've been going back and forth there ever since. And Dan Higgins, who thank goodness is on this call, has been the uh, person who's really held that together for many years and has gone back and forth. And um, so- Robin, uh, wait a minute, isn't it called Bill We now? And also, do you want me to try and, and take minute and take minutes or, or um, yeah, anyways? Yeah. Uh, yeah, if you could, this is uh, Jane Henley, who is a Wolf member. That would be wonderful if you take minutes. And okay. it's called <laughs> Bill We, but when this banner was made, it was still a uh, Puerto basis. So what can we do? All right. And in addition, I want to uh, boldly uh, recommend this wonderful um, tape about the uh, Dawn of the People, Nicaragua's liter Literacy Crusade. That was the first time I was in Nicaragua in 1980. And um, and with Doreen Craft and Jay Craven, and it's a, a remarkable document, and it's on our website, uh, green uh, greenvalley.com, and you can go there and play it. And here's another one, oops, called "We Have Other Plans," which I made later on, which is a, not at the Pacific Coast, but on the Atlantic Coast, in a, a journey I did with. Alliance for the, the same group that you traveled with. Um, Alliance for Global Justice. Alliance for Global Justice. So this was uh, this is a document of going to Nicaragua way back in, wow, I forget when, the early 20s, I think. So um, let's let's jump in here. Um, and uh, and let me introduce Jill Clark Gallup. She um, is a uh, translator and an activist in um, back and forth to Nicaragua and recently took a delegation there and Diane was on the delegation. And as I understand from the two of them, Diane is going to speak a bit first and then um, and then and then Jill will. So you want to start off, Diane? Um, okay, so I am, um, I, I know very little compared to Jill, who I greatly admire. She, um, she filled us all in and other and several other people in the brigade um, discussed at length the history of Nicaragua and the United States and, and in, um, the relationship that we've had to it. So um, the whole um, the 10 days was was very informative about so much. And she's been involved with Nicaragua so much. Unlike me, I only had one other trip to Nicaragua. It was in 2019. And, um, and that was right after the 2018 coup attempt. And I didn't even know it hardly. I knew something had happened, but we were, I was with a medical mission and they never talked about it at all. And so, um, you know, I guess we talked about other, lots of other things, but not that. Anyway, um, so I, I just was really loved the trip. And I got, as soon as I got there, I um, met a woman who has lived in Nicaragua for, I don't know, 15 years, I think. And she had talked about all the great changes that have happened uh, since when she first started. And so um, 
I, you know, the whole, the whole time was just very informative and, and it was really heartening to see the people trying so hard um, to have the, the health care and, uh, and just bring up the standards of living and, and support women, which is, it was really kind of a women's delegation and that was really our emphasis. And then we saw uh, women's co-ops and we went to them and we went to parliament. So the whole time was just meeting with different people. We met with trade, trade union representatives. And uh, like I said, six women from parliament. Mm -hmm. So it was very informative and and I, um, well, first of all, I, I didn't get sick, which was wonderful because typically on my trips to Central America, I, I have big problems. Um, at first, usually, and um, and the, everything was just really nice. The that was organized so well, and um, Jill. I just want to say a little bit about her because she was our she was the translator, and they had these machines so she could translate in at the same time as someone was speaking, so we didn't have to go back and forth. And um, and the room that the place we stayed in was called Casa Ben Linder, Benjamin Linder, and he was killed by the Contras in 1987, I think. And well, after the 80s, um, well, the 80s were, you know, there was all the Contras going on and the big um, put down of the revolution attempts. And so, um, Anyway, that's it was named the, the place we stayed at was named for him and there are murals all over and artwork. So it's it's a great place to stay. And her uncle was very instrumental in so many things. And then her, the room that we were staying in was named for her mother, who has done so much dealing with Nicaragua. And um, so I just felt, I, I feel honored to have Jill speak because she just has so much of the history and her sister we, was one of the guest speakers. And she's lived in Nicaragua, I think for like almost long time, 20 years, I think. Anyway, Jill will tell us. But um, so I just wanted to say, I, I just um, real quick, the trip was very, you know, lots of meetings. And, um, and, but at the last day, we managed to go to um, a crater lake and go swimming. And it was really steep down in, on the sand to get into the lake. Um, and then we actually saw a volcano in the evening. And there was, it was, you could look down and see the lava bubbling. And there was this red glow all over. And then afterwards we went to a dinner and uh, we got a gift and I have it over there, but it's just had different things. And at, many, at various places, we got little things that people gave us. And it, I almost felt like we were treated like royalty um, the way that um, we were received. So I just, but basically it's very impressive, the changes that are happening there with the healthcare and the education and trying to bring up the standard of living. And um, I just can't say enough about the good things about it. So if you have any questions I can ask later, but I think that's good enough now. Okay, well, thank you, Diane. And uh, yeah, so uh, Jill should um, tell us more and there will be time at the end for questions. And I know a lot of us um, uh, do have questions who have followed some of the changes that have happened in the last five years. So. Uh, please, please, uh, please start, Jill. Thank you. And thanks, Diane. It's uh, great to hear your impressions. And I want to assure everybody that everyone in Nicaragua is not related to me. It's a little embarrassing <laughs> to hear Diane talk about it. But my mother was at the Nicaraguan embassy in Washington in, the, in 1985 to 1990. And she did deal with a lot of sister cities. So I don't know if anybody working on the uh, Puerto Cabezas, Burlington sister city had dealings with her. But and her name? Could you say Rita, her name? Rita Clark. And your uncle's name? Uh, Father Miguel de Scotto. He was the foreign minister in the 1980s and then the, um, the president of the UN General Assembly in 2008, 2009, and involved in a lot of things. But anyways, um, so uh, uh, just to tell you the purpose of this delegation, it was to look at women's rights in Nicaragua and how Nicaragua came to be 
um, rated so highly by the UN and the World Economic Forum in terms of gender parity. So um, we wanted to look at, at, at how this came about. And we, in doing so, we visited clinics and a hospital, um, maternity wait home and women's police station and government offices, including the Ministry of Women. And we met women parliamentarians. And then we spent time in three communities of women, uh, Women's Farming Cooperative, as Diane mentioned, an organization in Matagalpa that's working on violence against women and the Feministili that I'll tell you more about in a minute. So I thought now I could show you some pictures and talk a little more about what we did. And then um, we could- I just shared let's see. the screen. You gave me the ability to share a screen. Okay, let's do that. And okay, so I'm screen sharing. Oh, and now I need to put it in slideshow. <clears throat> okay, so you can see there were about, at this point, there were 27 of us. Uh, there were two Canadians who got COVID on their second day on the visit, and as one of them said, they got voted off the island. They had to isolate, so they weren't with us for the rest of the trip. But you can see different uh, people there from the delegation. Uh, th th uh, this was in Managua at an overlook of the city. And this is the Casa Benjamin Linder, named for Ben Linder, who, as Diane said, was he was a 27-year-old um, American who was um, a mechanical engineer doing uh, little hydroelectric energy projects in the countryside, and he was targeted and killed by the Contras in 1987, along with two Nicaraguans. Uh, this was when we were at the Ministry of Women, just some pictures they have there. This is a... Uh, um, a kind of historic photo of a, a woman gorilla right around the time of the triumph of the revolution, maybe 1979, 1980. Um, this is a statue that I don't remember, but these are other scenes in Managua. I didn't take the pictures. I was always interpreting, so other people took the pictures. This day here was really cool, I thought. Um, we went to visit um, a Christian-based community and uh, People aren't familiar with Nicaragua. Nicaragua's revolution coincided with the liberation theology movement in Latin America. And there were Christian-based communities in Nicaragua, El Salvador, Brazil, and other countries. And these were Catholics who believed very much in um, taking care of the poor here on earth and liberating them here on earth. And they have this a saying, between Christianity and revolution, there is no contradiction. And that's why people like my uncle and a few others that were priests that were in the government, and there were many lay people who considered themselves um, Christians who fought for revolution. And so this Christian-based community still exists. And it was really interesting to talk to them. They run their own service. They don't have a priest. And it was three women up at the head table running the service. People uh, who are not even religious were very moved by it because it's a very vertical structure. And in discussing with them, we got into to talking about some of these conflicts with the Catholic Church that you hear a bit distorted in the U.S. media. But there are conflicts with the Catholic Church hierarchy in Nicaragua. They're very much on the side of the old order. And as... Uh, as we talked later with some of the peasant um, feminists in Nicaragua who talk about fighting against um, what capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy, the, the Catholic hierarchy very much represents all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, so there's this is uh, Mukasa, who was one of our delegates, um, uh, led us in cheers often at the end of our meetings. And uh, this is the, the next day in Ciudad Sandino, um, a large municipality on the outskirts of Managua that has, um, has come to be the largest municipality in, in Nicaragua. It was always where people surviving different disasters would go to live. And it's some of the poorest of the poor people in Nicaragua still. But we saw this very interesting clinic, which is actually privately run by the organization that runs the Casa Ben Linder. They're called Jubilee House Community. And we learned about projects, uh, things, how the government runs healthcare and how this little organization that, that started 
in 1995 has gradually been doing less and less in healthcare as the government takes over uh, the needs, but we still learned very interesting things going on there. There you can see us. Now here we're at um, a Casa Materna, and that's a maternity wait home. I think there are about 182 of them now throughout Nicaragua. This is something that um, you might have heard of in the 1980s and 1990s. They started um, with little NGOs, and now the government has taken them over and made them available throughout the country. So this is where women who are either experiencing a high-risk pregnancy or who live in remote areas can come for the last um, two or three weeks of pregnancy to be safe and to be close to a hospital for an institutional birth. They can bring their own midwives if they'd like to. And on the Caribbean coast, I understand that they bring, you know, traditional medicine midwives. And um, so everything that the women are comfortable, they have good nutrition, they have good medical care, and they get um, you know, child rearing advice and breastfeeding advice. And so that that um, one of the statistics that's that's highlighted by the World Economic Forum is women's health and survival. And through um, vastly increased and free um, health care, that's part of why uh, maternal mortality has gone down by two thirds um, under the current government. And this maternity weight homes are also a big part of that. Is that and child infant mortality has also gone down. Is, is abortion he, is abortion legal in Nicaragua? Uh, oh, no, that's a very interesting topic, and I have heard that um, some people. I mean, I haven't heard this. I've seen myself that some people say that Nicaragua doesn't have rights for women because abortion is um, not legal. And um, we, I have found out on a previous visit and and confirmed in this visit as well that abortions are available for women to save the life of the mother. Um, actually, when I was there in November of 2021, we had a very interesting discussion with the doctor at this little clinic who also works for the Ministry of Health, and he said, "Well, you know, we as doctors have signed an oath to save lives." And but sometimes because of their religious beliefs, now less than half of Catholics, uh, less than half of Nicaraguans are now Catholics, and um, many are Protestants now or evangelicals, but they also seem to have conservative beliefs on this. And actually, the, the current abortion law was passed in 2006 um, before the FSLN came back into the presidency and when the FSLN still had a minority in the legislature. And um, it, uh, I know several people who believe that it was a deliberate tactic to put that up for a vote. And it's interesting, um, this similar legislation passed in El Salvador about the same time. And it's it seems that the thinking was that this would keep the FSLN from winning the presidency because they would vote against um, this uh, ban on abortion. And, and in fact, the FSLN told people that they were free from party, you know, from upholding the party line. They could vote their conscience on this vote. Some people voted for it and some people abstained. The MRS party, who has promoted themselves um, before and since then as the party of women's rights because they support abortion, they didn't vote for it either. Nobody in the whole legislature voted for that for that against that law because it was polling with over 80% support in the population. And they knew that it would have been political suicide to vote against that law. However, we see, uh, we talked with women who are very much in favor of the right to choose. And we see that they get um, free, um, free contraception through government clinics and readily available. This, this little clinic that we visited, they have, um, a program for implants for young women, and um, also free uh, sterilization um, operations after a woman has had the number of children that she would like to have. So um, I've heard in peasant communities that I've stayed in that most women after they've had two or three babies get, get their tubes tied before they leave the hospital. And um, and the other thing is that the um, the morning after pill 
is also readily available in Nicaragua. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that that is the most widely used form of so-called medical abortion in the United States, but you don't have that controversy around it in, in Nicaragua that we have here in the United States. And I'm hesitant to say that in a big public forum because I feel like that's just gonna give the National Endowment for Democracy an idea to go in and stir trouble in Nicaragua about the morning after pill. But as of now, it's, it's readily available. So this is, here you see Nicaragua Christian uh, Socialist and Solidarity. Um, this is at, at the Veles Pais Hospital. I don't know if there's a picture of the hospital. This is a new hospital. It's a beautiful, big state-of-the-art hospital. Uh, this woman is the Minister of Health. Uh, this woman right here is one of our delegates, and she's a pediatric surgeon from, um, from Maryland. And um, then I think we have, so you can see other pictures here. This woman here, which I think we can see her better. This woman is the director of the hospital. And she told us that people kind of look at her and say, you're the director of the hospital. You look so young, but she's, she's 39 years old. And this is what we found so many places that there are women running things. So this is um, the next day we, um, this was an impromptu meeting. We had met this woman here. Her name is Flor Avellan, and she is um, one of the leaders of the Self-Employed Workers Union, which is sounds kind of odd to us that you that self-employed workers have a union, but they formed in the early 2000s to protect. These were primarily street vendors wanting to protect their ability to sell on street corners or in front of buildings or in parks or whatever. So they actually formed a union. And um, in recognition of her leadership in that union, this Florida Avellan actually has a seat. She's um, you know, voted in as part of the FSLN, but she has a seat in the national legislature. And at this, we, we unexpectedly had free time on that day and she, um, she found out about that and she set up a meeting with the um, National Federation of Workers. And so we had this very enthusiastic and interesting meeting with them. And some of these self-employed uh, worker women came. They were very enthusiastic to come and talk to us about, um, about how they get um, very low interest loans and their different programs to help them and their children are getting so much better education and health services. Um, this is our group meeting at the Ministry of Women right there. Can you all see my little cursor when I move it around? You yeah. think that that's that's the Minister of Women of Women. And um, uh, we talked very briefly with her. I remember one of the questions, uh, Diane, you might remember was, um, is same sex marriage recognized in Nicaragua? And her answer um, it reminded me of this uh, debate about around the family's code in Cuba. And she said, she said, as, as the FSLN, we have no problem with that. We're in favor of same-sex marriage, but you can't just pass a law. Your society has to be ready for it. And that reminded me of the Cubans talking about um, these kinds of issues and just the process of society getting ready for it. So um, this is um, at the, the parliament, the, the National Assembly. And this lady is from, I think she's from Bilwi, right, Diane? This lady, oh shoot. Which, which one? The, right, this, the one on the right? This lady, the one oh, on the right. She's yeah. Dixon. She, um, I don't know, do, do the, the Burlington Bilwi people recognize her or know that name? No, I think, yeah, I think she's Caribbean from coast. she's from the Caribbean coast, but I think she's from the North Caribbean, not the South. Right, I think so too. But, oh yes, right, because she talked about the new bridge. Yes, and she was very moved when she was telling us about what an impact that had made on people's lives. So there's a new bridge. Um, that go that connects the highway all the way into uh, communities on the coast. The people used to take a ferry to get across this river, and it's a huge celebration. I think it might be the longest bridge now in Central America, but th these bridges and the roads that connect the Caribbean coast with the Pacific side, both the North Caribbean and the South Caribbean, ha have 
a huge impact um, in addition to the local universities that have been set up and new hospitals. There's a new hospital being built in Bilwi, and I think it's supposed to open up sometime in 2024, maybe towards the end of 2024. Um, so then we went to visit with these women in a, a farming cooperative. They primarily produce coffee for export, and you actually can buy it here in the United States through Friends of the ATC if anyone's interested. I can tell you how to get it. And these ladies, I visited them before and they do a, oh, I don't wanna leave them yet. They do a great job of telling you how life has changed for new generations, um, all for the better. Uh, this is uh, when we were in Matagalpa with an organization. Oh, I guess you can't see, can you see here? You can see Dorothy Granados. Oh shoot, I can't I can't show these smaller photos any bigger. But Dorothy Granados is a Chicana woman uh, from the U.S. who went to Nicaragua in the mid 1980s and stayed. And she's done different projects projects, but she's been doing this one for I think a, at least 20 years. And it's called the Skills to Save Lives Foundation, and they work with. Um, women and girls who are victims of violence or, or sexual abuse. And for example, they were talking to us about this beautiful program to um, with these young girls, you can see over here, who have been victims of sexual abuse. They've set up like um, support group for them and different after school activities. And they teach them how to do jewelry making and other kinds of hobbies. And they even sell them to make a little money. And they were talking a lot about wraparound services. And this is actually, we were hearing at the Ministry of Women as well, how women's ecol um, uh, gender equality is part of the school curriculum starting in the early grades and how um, in their program, they, inter they have interfaced with, with the schools and with something interesting called the women's police stations. And we visited one of these and we hear about how this is a place where victims of uh, women and children who are victims of violence and abuse can go and meet with people um, without men being there and people who are trained to not re-victimize the victims. So we had this meeting here in the women's police station with these police officers. And as uh, there, they gave us they gave us bags of coffee, right, Diane? Everywhere, it seemed like people were so happy that we came to talk to them. Right. Because, you know, not that many people are going to Nicaragua. Um, so, and one thing, interesting thing that came up in this discussion is somebody said, I, I, I don't see police officers with guns, where are your guns? And they said, no, we don't carry guns unless we're guarding a building or we're on a, you know, a drug sting operation or something like that. And, and uh, this lady, I think she's in charge of uh, PR for the police. And she said that they don't even have one gun for every police officer. Mm -hmm. So can you imagine? And, and I said, so, you know, how's your budget compared to other people? They said, we have, we have a, the lowest uh, police, actually the lowest police and national defense budget in Central America. But they also have an inside crime just put out um, their new statistics. They rate Nicaragua second lowest in the homicide rate in, in um, Latin America, only second to Chile. So we know that that Nicaragua has had less violence than um, its Central American neighbors, but even less than most of the whole region. Gil, um, Gil, this Gil, oh, let me I'm, interrupt for a second because um, I know Dan has to leave uh, <clears throat> early for an appointment. And so how about three more minutes and then we can have some questions? Sure. Okay, so this is Esteli. Uh, this is just traveling. So this is the group with the FEM, and I can talk about that um, afterwards so that um, Dan has a chance to ask questions. But this is another women's group that was founded in 1995 while there was a woman president, but it was a very difficult time for women in Nicaragua. Um, they didn't have, uh, especially peasant women, couldn't feed their children, uh, didn't have access to education. 
um, neither did their children, and they were experiencing violence in their homes, and so they organized uh, around all of those things, and, and also sexual and reproductive rights. And this is a talk at the end, and uh, there's my sister and Camilo Mejia, whom some of you may have heard of. He's an activist against the, the Iraq war, but a Nicaraguan. This is our group at a party there towards the end of our stay. Um, this is the old cathedral in downtown Managua. And that's it. <laughs> wow. So I'll stop share and let you ask questions. <laughs> Beautiful. Fascinating. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, um, and I see P Pamela Williams has joined us and Anita Rapone, welcome. Um, so are there questions now about this report? And um, please uh, mute, demute yourself if you do have a question. I've enjoyed the um, the pictures of Nicaragua. Thank you very much. <laughs> Unfortunately, I have to leave in a few minutes also, but mm -hmm. I, I want to learn more. <laughs> Dan, you're still muted. Technology is, am I, am I now? Yeah. Nope, we no. can hear you. Okay. <laughs> well, um, as Robin knows, I mean, Robin and I, in, in 1984, uh, in opposition to the Reagan administration trying to destroy the Sandinista revolution, uh, Burlington became a sister city through who knows what mechanism. And it's been that way for over 35 years. And what was an interesting learning curve for all, for all those of us in Vermont who knew maybe a little bit about Nicaragua, but not a lot, was that the Caribbean side, the sister city in the region that we became sister cities with was not pro-Sandinista and was, was in fact very, it was a Contra area. And so we've, we've slowly um, become, we've watched things evolve and it's been very, a very interesting process. Um, looking, you know, seeing how things have gone. Um, and I, I don't, I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to bad mouth Nicaragua, but the, but the Sandinistas have not been particularly great in dealing with the indigenous population there, which is mostly mosquito. Um, and a lot of the efforts that go into making life materially better for people have ignored some of the spiritual or some of the aspects of, of what, what people feel in that in that part of Nicaragua. And certainly the most important um, concept in the on the East Coast in, in the Caribbean side in Puerto Cabezas, which or Bilwi, um, is the concept of autonomy. And slowly and slowly and sometimes not so slowly, that's been eroded by the central government. Um, out of out of Managua for whatever reason, I mean they have a they have their narrative that they're worried about the United States and so forth. Well, the the mosquito people have a similar narrative, except that they're under assault from the from the federal government. So it's it's been an interesting um, it's been an interesting history, and and I, I don't think there's time to talk about that right now. But um, things aren't doing from from our report of people that we know in, in, in Bilwe, things are not very good right now. And uh, both economically and, and um, you know, like Mar Margarita, which you know, Robin, was in tears on a Zoom call with me because she said our culture is just being decimated. And and a lot of, uh, a lot of, um, you know, it's a little bit like what the United States did with its indigenous population, I think, uh, you know, 150, 200 years ago. And it's um, so I don't want to just give a glowing report about the Sandinistas. There's there's a lot of problems and they are an authoritarian regime and they don't allow uh, much that doesn't fit their narrative is my sense of it. Hmm. So that's I'll stop with that and see what Jill, you can respond to that. Oh, sure. 
Yeah, I think that we should look into this more, Dan, because um, what I hear from I think I think you are right that the the Sandinistas made mistakes with the mosquito population in the 1980s, and there has been a lot of work to repair that relationship. And I think that the the auto I but I've heard from mosquito people. Um, who have a favorable opinions of what's happening and the autonomy is further consolidated. Um, so I think I, I think we should look at this more. And actually, um, I helped organize a course about women in Nicaragua, an online course. And the people who did that with me um, are interested in supporting us to do a course about the um, the autonomy, the autonomous regions of Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they have the, the cool thing is they they don't have to rely on professionals from the Pacific side anymore. And um, you're, you're very right that it has a different development. And there were many mistakes made in the 1980s. But now um, the people, the Caribbean coast people uh, have their own universities, their own hospitals, their own um, health care that combines traditional medicine with Western medicine. And I think we should hear from them what they have to say. Yeah. And I, ha I have to say that um, uh, I had friends who came to um, accompany the national elections in Nicaragua in November of 2021, who went to the Caribbean coast and who just talked to people, not uh, people who just came up to vote, not, not a certain kind of people or not anybody selected by the government. And they found overwhelming support for the government. And in fact, the North Caribbean coast gave the government some of the highest votes in the whole country. And people talked to, to, to the people I know who went there about all the roads that were built and about having health care and the fact that they'd had two category four hurricanes that hit right them, you know, and, and it caused devastation all the way up to Guatemala, but it hit first in Nicaragua on the Caribbean coast and nobody died. A few people died in the second one who refused to evacuate, but the government mobilized um, people to get evacuated. And um, they responded very well to the hurricane. Um, yeah, they did. And um, and and I guess one of the things that I, I mean, I understand it, it's a different narrative, but the, but one of the things that's had a big impact is that the the government has outlawed NGOs from the United oh, States. Oh, yeah. And that's a NGOs were a major part of what of people's the life in, in that town. Um, we, we we ran into some problem even, you know, getting money to people. And, uh, you know, so that's that's an example of of suddenly the NGOs were playing a really big role. And I don't think they were doing that much to upset the, the Fed, you know, the Sandinista government, which is sort of what they said was happening. Maybe some of them were, but, um, you know, they were like the, the Danish were running health care. They, they were a lot of there was a lot going on that suddenly was made illegal, um, which is which has had a big impact. Mm -hmm. uh, from what people tell me. And I was hoping, as Robin said, to have, we were hoping that one of the uh, people we've worked with was going to be in Burlington this month. And uh, we've lost track of him. You know, he, start, he, he started, he said a lot of people are starting to, to leave that area to go into the United States. And I don't know what's become of him. Um, so it's, so I'm just, I, I don't know a lot of what's happening at this point, but but it sounds like things aren't as rosy as 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 it seems. Uh, uh, Jill, could you tell us about the um, the people who are released from prison who have then left Nicaragua? Um, yes, this happened on Thursday. Um, there, so in the the coup attempt of 2018, um, there were. Uh, people who were arrested, who were engaged in very horrible acts of violence. And um, there were other people being investigated. But after a lot of pressure from the OAS and 
United States in 2019, a year later, Nicaragua issued an amnesty for any crimes committed in 2018, as long as people did not commit new crimes. And in 2021, in the lead up uh, to the, the uh, presidential elections and national elections, um, there was actually, it was discovered in 2020, a plot by the, the NED and USAID to have a coup in Nicaragua, basically around the election results. And in 2021, people began to be arrested who were um, found to be complicit in that in that coup plot. And that included a lot of people tied to NGOs. And the, the NGO funding is, is a real issue, like Dan is talking about, but it's a very, it's a complex issue. And I'd love to have a, a longer conversation with you about that, Dan, sometime when you have time, because it is very complex. And I know good organizations who have had a really hard time dealing with this, but it's it's not something that the government was cracking down on just because it, uh, NGOs have been used as a channel to fund um, illicit activities. It's also because the Financial Action uh, Task Force required this of Nicaragua and of mm -hmm. other countries, and Nicaragua got taken off the gray list because there was no accounting for what people were doing with money. And Cristiana Chamorro, who is one who... Um, you know, she was being asked, she she has an organization, she's from one of the, the most famous oligarch families in Nicaragua, who's had many presidents over Nicaragua's history, and had this, um, this paper called La Prensa, and she was using it to funnel in money to other um, press outfits that they funnel in money from the NED. And she had been asked to you know, there was the legislature passed a new law for um, accounting of funds, of, very much like the foreign agents law in the United States from back from like the 1930s. And um, she kept saying, well, I'm not going to comply with that law. I'm just going to shut down my organization. But in fact, she just put seven million dollars into her own bank account that she was getting in. Um, that she had been funneling through her organization. And as it came closer to the fact that she was really being investigated for sure. She was saying things like, the State Department says my accounts are all in order. You're like, she doesn't know that she doesn't live in the United States and that she's subject to the laws where she lives. And then she went and declared herself a pre, she invented this thing, a pre-candidate for the presidency. And so when she got arrested, that was the news in the corporate media in the U.S. that a pre-candidate for the presidency was arrested and such thing as pre-candidate doesn't exist. And there, there were others who also suddenly called themselves pre-candidates. But, uh, you know, I know I know other sister cities that had trouble with this. I know that the, the financial reporting requirements are a big burden. But I also know that there was a lot of NGOs that came up in the 1990s and the early 2000s to do things that government is supposed to do. Yeah. And it's very delicate for some to understand when they need to step back and let it be sustainable and let the government do what it's supposed to do. But yeah. sister cities have a special role. And I'm sure that your sister city, you know, has has all of the best intentions, but I know that it's still onerous requirements. and. Yeah, that's that's well, a good I, thing. I would love to talk. You, I have a, a six o'clock dental appointment that I've got to go to. <laughs> but I, I would love to talk with you more, Jill. If you're, oh, you know, I'd Jill love to. Yeah, yeah. Just for, let's keep before. in touch with email. Yes, that'd be great. And okay. Robin, thanks for inviting me to this. Sure. And thanks for having your poster on the wall behind you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Good. All right. So, are there any other questions for Jill or for Diane? Uh, we're still being uh, recorded, and this will be going to CCTV. So, ask your questions now. And um, uh, yeah, I want to ask whether ask what 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 cities what cities what regions you vis you visited. I thought I heard the word. I thought I heard the name. Mad, Mad, I heard, thought I heard Madagalpa at one point, and I wondered you know, about, about other places that you were visiting. Yes, we we went to. Uh, we were in Ciudad Sandino and Managua, and then we 
um, we went to a small community of Santa Julia near El Crucero, which is not that far from Managua. And then we spent a day in Matagalpa and we spent a day in Esteli. And then we were back in Managua and uh, Messiah. Mm -hmm. So we did not have time to, we had a very packed agenda and did not have time to go to the Caribbean coast, but I would love to go with Dan and the, um, the Puerto Cabezas Burlington people to, to Bilwi sometime. Yeah, and it's easier to get there now. There's a highway, right? Yes, uh, yes. From Managua. Any other questions um, for Jill or Diane? Yes? Well, if not, I'm going to call this meeting to an end. And thank you so much, Jill and, and Diane. And I hope we'll hear more from you because, as I understand it, you're going to be living in... Burlington part-time uh, in the future. So thank you so much for coming.